Our episode opens with Dax still commanding the Defiant. She's working with Martok to draw in Dominion ships and then ambush them. All right, that's two down a Googleplex to go. Way to go, team. They get called back to the Starbase, and Dax makes it clear how bad morale is at the moment, that the Alliance needs a major victory to not only turn the war around, but to give their people some hope that they're not throwing their lives away for nothing. In fact, I'm presenting a plan to Starfleet Command at 0800 tomorrow. What plan? My 999 plan. I take 999 ships and fly them right up to Kat's ass. We're going to retake Deep Space Nine. Yeah, how'd you miss that giant diagram on the wall, Dax? We need a plan, damn it! Any plan, like, like this one over here. Why in God's name haven't you worked up a plan yet? Cisco presents it to the other Starfleet leaders, but there's uncertainty as to whether or not it's worth committing so many troops to try to take an area that the Dominion has likely heavily fortified. What's more, if the Dominion doesn't pull back to protect the station, Earth could be left vulnerable to a counterattack before this armada could get back and defend it. No, no, we're not doing this. You do it for Randolph Scott. Randall Scott. Randall Scott. All right, Captain, we'll give it a chance. On DS9, we're witness to an essential plot element. Morn's mother wants him to come to her birthday party, but he doesn't want to. Yeah, this is real essential to this story. How about if we move on? Kira and Quark try to ask Odo what's up with Rom being locked up still, but they're not allowed in to talk to him, and it's very, very serious. Come on, guys. It's not like Odo and the Changeling are screwing or anything, and... So, that is how the Solids experience intimacy. Oh, hell. Jeez, it's like walking in while your grandparents are doing it. And what have you learned? That what they consider intimacy is only a shadow of what we experience in the Great Link. I mean, it wasn't even three minutes and it was over. Or yes, uh, and most solids can't even go for that long. And you regret not having experienced it with Major Kira. Oh, no, 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 don't answer that, Odo. See, this is what they do right before the link. See, they say, what about all those wild oats you didn't sow? And then when you answer honestly, boom, that's when it happens. No, no, keep your mouth shut. Say, the link is fine with me. That's all I ever needed. Trust me. What we start to get from this scene is that Kira is still of great importance to Odo in spite of the previous episode's ending showing some sign of regret in his decision. Or maybe she's right, and that's the whole you won't be able to hump Kira ever again thing. Anyway, they link and everything's all better. <laughs> wow. Give it a rest, Odo, really. Even Ducat took time out every now and then to drink some Gatorade and rotate the chickens. With no help from Odo, Kira goes to see Weyoun, who agrees that Ram will be released as soon as he's been executed for trying to sabotage the station and for coming up with that idea for the self-replicating minds in the first place. Kira asks the Bajoran government to lodge an official protest, and Quark even gets the Grand Nagus to offer to buy Rom's freedom, but neither does any good. Quark tries to find a way to rescue him somehow, but Rom has even greater concerns. You have more important things to worry about. The bar is doing fine, but thanks for caring. No, it's about taking down the deflector to stop the Dominion. The fate of the entire Alpha Quadrant rests in your hands. Billions and billions of people are counting on you. Be disappointed. The next option is to ask Zial to appeal to Dukat on Ram's behalf. He's naturally shocked at the suggestion, but she points out that a pardon from him would show everybody the kind of man he really is. Well, we do get to see the kind of man he is, all right. His immediate reaction to this is to stand up, look her in the eyes, and ask if she had anything to do with what Ram was doing. He doesn't care about anything except covering their asses. He even emphatically states that Ram deserves to die as an enemy of the state would. Well, that's not the kind of thing to create strong family bonds, so she storms off. Quark's plan isn't much better. Nausicaan mercenaries to break Rom out, but Kira points out this kind of thing calls for an Ocean's Eleven, not a Leroy Jenkins. They'll need a new plan. And there doesn't seem to be any options left for one. And to make things worse, Damar's tests are successful with deactivating the mines. Okay, I said we'd get to it eventually, so let's talk about the mines. First, hey... Always nice when we show a sign that technology is actually going to be examined and used in a different way. And the idea is certainly original enough. But the problem with the self replicating minds is, well, the replication. Replicators can't make something out of nothing. It's not a magic goodie creator. It's a piece of technology. So it has to come from somewhere, either energy or matter. Matter is the most logical, as turning energy into matter would be well, ridiculously inefficient, like roasting hot dogs over a campfire made of $100 bills. 
For instance, one of Picard's T Earl Grey hots would need a combination of matter and antimatter comparable to the weight of the tea in the mug. And that assumes 100% energy efficiency, which is actually not possible according to thermodynamics. Because even in Federation science, you can't get more concentrated energy than a matter-antimatter reaction. So the replicator almost certainly works like a specialized transporter, using some kind of raw matter and just putting the bits together to produce the desired result. Rather than a teacup size of fuel, you would have a teacup size of raw materials. So if a mine is going to replicate another mine, it would need as much raw material as itself. And where would it get that from? Well, I checked the DS9 technical manual. Yes, I have one. To offset the nerdiness, I challenged a bear to a knife fight first. Okay, so the tech manual is responsible for trying to explain all this stuff and have it try to make some kind of sense. So they say, yeah, replicators use some kind of raw matter. And obviously, because you can't put an entire mine inside of every other mine, you have to split it all up. So they say that 1 65th of it, the material that it needs to make a new mine is found in each mine. So you need 65 mines to replace one. Okay, so what happens when it runs out? I mean, once it's replicated a mine, that's it. It needs to get this fuel back, and I don't see the Federation coming around and refueling these things. So they said, um, zero-point energy, yeah! Essentially, free energy, but to replace a mine? Say this thing weighs 20 kilos. That's not very much, actually, but let's assume that it's that small. The energy to fashion one of those is monstrous. The Tsar Bomba, the biggest nuke ever detonated, because everything is huge in Mother Russia, would produce maybe one-eighth of the energy that you would need here. And we're trying to collect energy not from nuclear explosions, but essentially the background of the universe. It's like participating in the decathlon will not help you lose enough weight, except you're not doing a decathlon, you're sleeping on the couch and hoping you're going to get better results. Okay, so even by Star Trek's made-up science, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter because Technobabble can also trump Technobabble. So Damar's plan will get the minefield down in a week. There's nothing our heroes can really do to stop it. The only option is to warn Starfleet and maybe they can get here in time to stop it by force. But how to do that with the Dominion's tight control? Who is it that could save the Alpha Quadrant from Dominion domination? He's going home for his mother's birthday or something. He has an encrypted message from my dad in one of her presents. Oh my god, the entire future of the Star Trek universe turned on the Mourn's mom's birthday party point? Okay, I give you credit for slipping that one under the radar, Star Trek. We soon see Sisko and Ross looking over the message. There's not enough time left to finish gathering all their forces, not to mention the problem with the Klingons. Sisko had been trying to get them to back his plan to retake DS9, but Gowron was reluctant. So Martok and Worf are sent off to persuade him, but they're not going to make it back in time either. But there's no choice. They have to send in what ships they have and hope they can get through and destroy the emitter, or this war is lost. Anyway, Dukat tries showing their movement towards success, but Wayun's weak eyes make it difficult to see. The poor Vorta. While Wayun harshly defends the job the founders did in creating them, they have poor vision, no sense of taste, and no sense of aesthetics. Forget the Jemadar, at least they get to have all the drugs they need. The Vorder are built like an off-brand humanoid and worship their creators for the half-assed job they did. Well, comrade, we've got trouble. Right here in River City. With a capital T that rhymes with three that stands for Zial. See, as Dukat is ready to bring down the minefield and usher in the fleets that will conquer the Alpha Quadrant, he wants his daughter by his side, so he wants Damar to convince her to come to him. Problem is, Damar dislikes the Bajorans, and she's half Bajoran. And he is not a people person anyway. But it's even worse because she's talking to Kira, and there's three important things to remember. One, Kira is very protective of Zial. Two, she also dislikes Damar almost as much as she does Dukat. And three, she's had a very bad week. Still, Damar has a very firm grasp of the situation. Your father is a great man, a man of destiny. But he also carries great burdens. He knows our alliance with the Dominion is a dangerous one. If we show any sign of weakness, our allies will turn on us. That is why we must all help him remain strong. Damar has been with Dukat ever since Return to Grace, watched him rise from a mere captain of a transport ship to the head of Cardassia that's seizing control of the Quadrant. He's a true believer, which means he's going to unwittingly destroy the man he believes he is helping. But not now. First he's got to sort out Zial, which leads to a confrontation with Kira, and eventually her beating seven kinds of shit out of him. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, let's see how things are going back on Cisco's station. 
Admiral, why is there a requisition for 11 orangutans, 15 small bridal gowns, 1,200 individually wrapped Eskimo pies, and a crew of holographic recorders? I don't have to explain myself to you, Captain. No, but I wish you would. No, you don't. Yeah, you're probably right. Actually, this is a scene which helps differentiate DS9 again from its sister shows. The episode ran short, which sometimes can happen, so they had to fill it out. On Voyager, Ron Moore commented on his disdain for one of his episodes, Survival Instinct, which, when it ran short, was padded out by a technobabble description that did nothing for the story. In contrast to that, when they needed to fill out this episode, Sisko talks about when this is all over, he's going to go and build a house on Bajor, that he's fallen in love with the world and wants to retire there. I know I seem like a DS9 fanboy sometimes, but I feel it's worth championing this kind of approach. We don't pad out a story to meet airtime. We find what we can add to complement the story. In this case, we get to see Sisko's hope for the future, see what he's fighting for, and that he hopes for a piece that he can enjoy. Also, it's a point that will be tied into in the next episode. Success often comes in finding a problem in your story and turning it into an opportunity. On the eve of battle, we see that Nog has been given a field commission of Ensign. O'Brien jokingly says things must be even worse than he thought, but the sad part is, it's not really a joke. Not a slight against Nog. It's just a sign that they've been losing so many between the Dominion War and the Cleon Conflict that they need to rush someone through to help fill out the ranks. Then again, I suppose you don't really need him to be off writing reports on the importance of mathematics on the rise of luxurious cathedrals during the Renaissance. Then what kind of officer is he? Damn Starfleet. This kind of thing would have never happened if I still had my own show. Odo, meanwhile, is showing how his attitude is conforming more towards that of the founders, coming to the female changeling on how pitiable all these people down there seem now, small and unimportant, but going about their lives as if they mattered. Must be how it looks from the stage in a presidential debate. When Wayun interrupts, he comments on the good job that the female changeling's been doing in neutralizing the threat that Odo represented to their plans. Bringing him home, returning him to the Great Link, means more to us than the Alpha Quadrant itself. So should we maybe call off this whole war thing? Get back to work! But Odo seems to be a bit bothered about, you know, betraying their cause through an action so that Ram will die, the Quadrant will fall, despotism will spread, and telling Kira that he couldn't give a shit, even with a high-powered colonic. So he tries to talk to her about it. I'm sorry. Sorry? That's what you wanted to tell me? You're sorry? Yes. Well, let me tell you something, Odo. We are way, way past sorry. Really, Odo, we're past sorry, flowers, chocolate, and back rubs. You're going to need diamonds, buddy, like as big as your head. Not a Hallmark card with a puppy covering its eyes with its paws and saying, Pobody's nerfect underneath it. Meanwhile, the Cisco is back in the seat of his baby to lead from the front, as the fleets he does have prepare to go head-to-head -head with the Dominion's defending fleet that's between them and the wormhole. With time short, it looks like the only way to DS9 is through them. As an old saying... Fortune favors the bold. Ah, yes, the famous quote originating from Turnus in the Aeneid. Um, didn't he lose that war? The post-episode follow-up. Annoying character goes to Jake for drawing out his scene about how, as a reporter, he has his ways of getting things done. The guy barely gets showtime, yet they keep turning him into a dickhead whenever they do. Final score for Favor the Bold is 6 out of 10. It has the difficult job of bridging between the first and last parts of the story block, but it does that job adequately. One shot I liked was the report Ducat gives to Weyoun on Sisko's fleet coming, heading towards DS9. No attention is paid to it, but the director shot the scene so that Sisko's baseball was in the foreground, a subtle reminder on the promise it stands for, that he is returning to retake DS9. Next time we'll see if he can deliver on that promise. Stop saying that. I didn't say it, he did.